You are listening to an Eagles Wings Ministries River of Life podcast. So let's get started. Hey everybody, Dr. Rudy Rodriguez here. Welcome to an Eagles Wings Ministries River of Life podcast. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for coming. The River of Life podcast is produced every week for your enjoyment. So come back often and feel free to click on the iTunes button to subscribe to our podcast or click on the RSS feed audio buttons to add this podcast to your favorite RSS feed. The presence of the Holy Spirit leads us to live in the power of the anointing. But if you are willing to pay the price, it is available. Pastor Benny Hinn was important in my introduction to the Holy Spirit and to the truth of both the presence and the anointing of the Spirit. I always heard him talk about the price he had to pay. So one day I prayed and said, Lord, let your anointing be on me as it is on Pastor Benny. The Lord spoke back to me and he said, pay the price and I will give it to you. What price, I asked. Well, the answer didn't come immediately, but one day, it came suddenly from the Holy Spirit. He took me to Acts chapter 4, verse 13, and it says, Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, perceived that they were uneducated and untrained, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. So what is the key? It's spending time with Jesus over and over and over again, constantly. Not just about not just a few minutes a day or once a day, but constantly in communion with Jesus. You know, you will learn how the Holy Spirit can lead you to experience the fullness and the power that God had each and every day. So once you grasp what the anointing holds for you and experience the depth and the rich reality of that precious touch, you will never be the same. So let's talk about this valuable gift. You know, people have asked me over the years, what do you value most as a Christian? And each time my answer is the same. Except for my salvation, I value the anointing the most. The phrase, the anointing, may be unfamiliar to some of you, but this teaching should change that. I have never been the same since God first graced my life with the precious anointing of the Holy Spirit. And those last four words are important. Because the anointing is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And it is performed by the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby no human can ever do this for you. What God has taught me about the special touch of the anointing has caused me to treasure my relationship with our ever-present companion, the Holy Spirit. Even more, I know now that there are several types of anointing, and we will explore this later in the series. And I know that it is possible for me to forsake the Master and forfeit this intimate relationship that I have with my entire being. I could, by an act of my own will, turn my back on Him and alienate myself from His fellowship. But I will never do that. As I've said before, I'd rather die than lose His touch. So it can be today or even every day of your life if you desire. A day of the reality of the Holy Spirit with you, whereby the anointing rests upon you. You know, your desire can be fulfilled. But you probably, perhaps you, like many others have said, Rudy, I desire the experience of God's power in my life, but I really don't know how to make it happen. I love God and I know that He loves me, but I have a longing for a deeper, more intimate relationship. But I don't know about Him. I want to know Him and to experience the reality of His power regularly. But you know, rest assured that your desire can be fulfilled. Why? Because He's heard your cry. So the first thing He would have you know is that He intensely desires His children to experience His presence not once or twice, but every day. And He longs for them to know not only His presence, but also His communion and power. My friend, you can't know the power of God's anointing until you experience the presence of God. Many have misunderstood the real meaning and essence of the anointing. They think it's some form of goosebumps experience that is only a matter of feeling and thus short-lived. That is untrue. When the anointing of the Spirit comes upon your life, all confusion will vanish. 
you will be transformed forever. Isn't that awesome? So my question is to you, are you dead to self? You know, we hear this all the time when we talk about crucifying the flesh. Only when you abandon yourself, totally emptying yourself, can you be filled with God's presence. Then and only then can you see Acts 1.8 be fulfilled. And it's the promise of power, which I will discuss later, fulfilled in your life. For as His presence envelops you, His power can begin to pour out of you. I will tell you about the death to self, which sounds so frightening and impossible. When I first heard this, I was terrified. What do you mean? Am I going to die? But I will share how I first came to experience the anointing and how that moment revolutionized my life. I will tell you about this person called the Holy Spirit. So many know so little about him, and he is really God. They ignore him by never talking to him by never asking him to be with him a daily, minute by minute, part of their entire existence. They seem to prefer pleading and begging, then becoming irritated when they see no answers. How many of you have experienced this? How many of you have been in prayer, and you're begging and pleading and wondering why your prayers aren't answered? Well, you will find out in this series. When I came to the point where I said, Come Holy Spirit, I realized that the chaos and confusion of life in the world ceased to exist. Darkness turned into light. My empty heart was filled, and my ears were open to hear the voice of the Father. The voice of the Father is absent without the presence of the Holy Spirit surrounding you. But you may ask, why doesn't the Holy Spirit, if He's God and knows everything, just help us and give us what we need? I've asked that same question. I'm sure you're asking it too. But the answer is that he is a gentleman and will never push his way into your life. But the second you say, Holy Spirit, help me receive what I am asking for. He comes and helps you receive through Jesus what you have asked the Father for. You see, he wants communion and fellowship with you. He seeks a moment by moment relationship. One in which you can actually have the mind of Christ according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16. So when the Holy Spirit is a reality in your life, He provides an avenue through which the anointing, the power, can flow. Do you remember when Peter, James, and John were with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration? And you can find this in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. Do you know that the cloud settled on them also? Have you ever wondered what is the cloud? Well, it is the Holy Spirit. So when you read in the Old Testament of the cloud descending upon the tabernacle, like in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, which you are really read, reading about the Holy Spirit. Also, remember when Jesus ascended after his resurrection? He went up in what? He went up in a cloud. The cloud received him. And you find this in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Again, that was the Holy Spirit. When Jesus returns, he will be riding on that same cloud. And you can find this in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. So in these cases, when the Lord spoke, where was His voice? Actually, it came from the cloud. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings the voice of God into your heart with clarity. If you haven't experienced a daily walk in which the things are reality, you need to understand what the presence and the anointing are. But I don't want to limit you, limit God and what He will do in your life because I know as you receive the Spirit's presence, seven things found in the beautiful 8th chapter of the book of Romans will occur in your life. By themselves, they are actually worth everything. The first thing that's going to happen is you will be liberated from sin. You, like so many others, may have struggled in the area of your life that you have not been able to overcome for years. But the Bible says that you will not be liberated from the law of sin until you fellowship with the Spirit. The second thing that will happen is righteousness will enter your life naturally. So as you learn to walk after the Spirit, you won't be forced into it. Your struggle for righteousness will give way to its abiding, easy flow. In other words, it's going to be just natural. You're not going to have to work to get into righteousness. Remember, Righteousness is right standing with God. The moment you accept Jesus as your, your Lord and Savior 
you became righteous because he is righteous. So you don't have to try to earn something you already have. The next thing, the third thing that's going to happen is your mentality will be changed. You're going to renew your mind. There you will be fed from setting your mind on the things of the flesh to setting them on the things of the spirit. In other words, the desires of the flesh will, will be changed into the desire of the things of the spirit. The fourth thing that's going to happen is you will become totally at peace. Do you remember what Paul says that to be spiritually minded is peace? And also in scripture it talks about the peace that surpasses understanding. That is the peace you will enter in. The fifth thing that's going to happen is you will be healed from your head to your toes. For he who was raised from the dead will give life or will quicken your mortal bodies, which the great majority of the body of Christ badly needs. Have you ever noticed that if you go to church, there's a lot of people still sick? Well, according to scripture, we're not supposed to be. That's part of the curse. So we need to find out why. The sixth thing that's going to happen is you will receive the total death to self and total life to God. For Paul says that if you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The seventh thing that will happen is you will receive intimacy with the Father. Isn't that glorious? So as by the Spirit, you look up into His face and say, Abba, Father, or Daddy. How many would love to have that experience? I know I did. I longed for it because I never had a really, really good relationship with my dad. But that was okay because my daddy, my, my heavenly father, has fulfilled that need that was missing. And you know, on top of that, of all these seven things, you will receive power to serve the Almighty God, which I personally know. By having met so many of you, i come to discover that there's a hunger for, and there's a lot of you who are ready to pay the price we talked about. So I am excited to be able to share these experiences and these understandings with you. For I know that the presence of the Holy Spirit and His anointing, multiplied among the millions of God's people, are the way the Lord will reach a needy world in our time. And I pray that you will be as excited as I am. So let's talk about the beginning. You remember I started speaking to the Holy Spirit? I, would, I said, Holy Spirit, God's word says that you are my friend. I don't know you. I don't think I know you. And I thought I did, but I realized I really don't. So can I meet you? Can I really meet you? The moment I said that prayer, guess what happened? The Holy Spirit invaded me. He came in like a mighty wind and he began to show me things. This began a year of intense experience with the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit. A year of fellowship and communion, of spirit-led Bible studies, of listening to the one described in God's word as teacher, counselor, and comforter. Do you know that the Holy Spirit became so real to me, he actually became my companion? When I opened the Bible, I knew he was there with me, as though he was sitting beside me. And he patiently taught me and loved me. I didn't see his face, of course, but I knew he was there. And I began to know his personality. A word of caution, watch what you do with the power you have. Be cautious with the power he has given to you. Don't play games and don't misuse it. This is actually a warning for all who seek and receive the anointing of the Spirit. Because God must be able to trust you. And He longs for us to know and experience His presence and His anointing. So when we are emptied of self, we will know His presence. But only then can we experience His power. The, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Only then can we experience His power. Through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But the trust factor is very important to God. And we must be faithful with what God has so richly given to us. So how many want to understand the price? Because what I'm going to teach right here is so holy. Turn off the tape, this teaching now. And I want you to pray in the spirit for a moment. Do you know that there is an anointing? and empowering for service that comes to paying, paying the price. It's actually taken me many years to reach this understanding. 
And I want to share it with you. Remember I mentioned what is the price? Well, it has taken me many years to reach this. In Psalm 63, Dave said something remarkable. He said, O God, you are my God. Early would I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Here is a glimpse of God's power and glory. David is longing for it. But how was he to get it? Here, the Holy Spirit began to open my eyes and make me understand what Pastor Benny meant when he spoke about the price and about dying. All the meetings we've gone to, all the teachings we've gone to, it's always talked about dying and paying the price. Even Catherine Coleman said the same thing. But I want you to notice something. Look at what David declares. He declares that his flesh longs for God while his soul thirsts. So there's a, there's a longing and there's a thirst. And the, the longing comes from the flesh and the thirst comes from the soul. In Isaiah verse 26, 9, we see something else. And it says that with his spirit, he will seek God. So there's the third key. So the first thing you need that happens is there's a, there's a longing of your flesh for God. And then the soul begins to thirst for the things of God. And finally, when you're almost there, it is your spirit that begins to seek the things of God. So let me touch on the tabernacle. I have another teaching on the tabernacle, which gets more in depth. But this is kind of just like a like an introduction. So if you would send me an email to Dr. Dr. Rudy, R-U-D-Y, at O-E-W-M, and just put in the subject, the tabernacle teaching, I will send it to you. I don't want to put it on the on our website because it's just too holy. Just send me an email for this teaching on the tabernacle and I will forward it to you. So let's come, let's continue. In the outer court, it is symbolic of the flesh. The holy place is symbolic of the soul. And the holy of holies is symbolic of the spirit. Longing takes one into the outer court. Thirsting takes one into the holy place. And seeking leads one into the holy of holies. So that's how it is. You go into the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Okay. So let's discuss the outer court for a minute. When you first came to know Jesus, you went through the door. And in that, through that door, it was Jesus. So now, once you go through Jesus, you enter into the outer court. As we long for God, you go into prayer, which is the place where God begins to deal with and crucify the flesh. It is a place of struggle. Where as we get, our, get on our knees each day, all we can think about at first is our guilt, our failures, and our great needs. It's all about me. We repeat ourselves over and over. And God seems to be a million miles away. We wonder if we're accomplishing anything. At least I did. Sometimes we want to fall asleep. Want to take a break. Do anything other than praying. What we don't immediately realize is that the longer we are on our knees, the less of the flesh remains. A death begins to our flesh as we are on our knees. Soon, as God finishes crucifying the flesh, a breakthrough begins to come. You feel it, and suddenly your prayer becomes real. A river gushes out of the innermost being And your words become meaningful. And the presence of God comes in. And something really happens to you. You may even begin to weep. Sometimes the breakthrough may take half an hour. Sometimes an hour or maybe even longer. It will be as long as needed. Depending on where you are with the Lord. And what your relationship is with Him. He must deal with the idols and the sins which are in your heart. Are there any Isaacs 
or any carnality in your heart, well, that must die. Because God is actually trying to get the Abraham out of you. So in other words, Isaac is anything that's cardinal. When you see Abraham, that talks about the spirit man. So if you haven't prayed for a long time, you can't expect a breakthrough after the first minute or two. Remember, this is a daily matter. The breakthrough doesn't come once for all time. You must die daily. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 31, you must die daily. You know, there, are, there will be a struggle each time you go into this kind of prayer. And the presence and the anointing don't come today because you died 24 years ago. No, they come today because you died this morning. God does not like leftovers. So don't rely on last year's or 20 years experience what you experienced when you first came to the Lord. He doesn't work that way. You must crucify the flesh daily. Now let's go into the holy place. The way you will know when the breakthrough comes is when guilt begins to disappear. The absence of guilt means you have broken through. You have sought him and you have found him. At some point then will come the thirsting for him. That is when your soul will begin to thirst for God. In Psalms 42 verse 1 and 2, David said, As a deer pants for water, brook, so pants my soul for you. O God, my soul thirsts for you. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? This is exactly what happens to us. Our soul begins to thirst to come before the living God. It thirsts for His presence. This thirst gets so strong that you would not be satisfied until you enter his, into His presence. We need to understand that David's picture here is perfect. Why? Because we need to know what why a deer seeks water. He seeks it for two reasons. One is because he's thirsty. That's a given. But the second one is because he is being chased by another animal. It could be a lion, it could be a tiger, it could be uh, pretty much anything. But one thing he knows is that his scent will be lost if he gets into the water. In other words, he will be safe. The same thing is with the believers. We thirst for the presence of God because it satisfies our souls and because the enemy cannot touch us. The devil can't find us. That's why David also wrote in Psalms 32 verse 7 where he said, You are my hiding place. So when you find that water for which your soul has been longing, praise will begin to erupt within you. You will know that you are in the holy place where praise is genuine. It's not just saying, praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It comes from the depths. So there will be none of the matter of fact or routine praise the Lord or thank you, Lord. It will become real. And every part of your being will be thanking Him. Even for those things that an hour ago you could not thank Him for. Everything will become beautiful. Even when you're going through trials and things aren't going right, you will be thanking Him for those things because you know that it's crucifying the flesh. So rejoice in all things. You know, the Lord says, <laughs> I always say, be happy. What was the song you say, be happy? So be happy for all things. So now let's go into the Holy of Holies. Do you remember that in Psalm 63 verse 2, David spoke of wanting to see God's power and glory. Well, that comes with the third stage of the price, the seeking and dying to self that must come before the anointing. And this is found in the Holy of Holies, which, remember, is symbolic of the Spirit. It is a place where you say nothing. You do nothing. You don't pray. You don't sing. All you do is receive. That's the place David meant when he said in Psalms 42, 7, Deep calls on to deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. Isn't that something? So, in the outer court, my mouth was talking to God. In the holy place, my soul was talking. And in the holy of holies, my spirit talks 
whereby it's the deep calling unto deep. This is where, in the holy places, where prayer without ceasing is born, where you bask in the glory of God. You are no longer longing, you are no longer thirsting, but you are actually drinking. And then Psalms 46.10 becomes alive where he says, Be still and know that I am God. Glory to God. When you enter the Holy of Holy, it is unreal. You are so full that you can't even talk because there are words that are inadequate and you are totally in His presence. You are not interested in what He can do for you. You are interested in knowing Him. Those who experience this are the sons of God, are the ones God can trust with the anointing. Those who experience this are the ones God can trust with the anointing. As you will see later, God will not trust the anointing to those who don't love Him or do not put Him as number one. He wants to be number one of everything. He wants to be number one. He, he doesn't want any idols before him. Because that was one of the commandments. He wants him, you all to himself. Okay? So as you enter the Holy of Holies on a daily basis, it will become more natural. And it will be quicker to enter in. It may take you half an hour to break through. Or it may take you five minutes. I have had times when the second I said, Lord, there it was. Also, the more time you remain in the presence of God, the more that presence will rub off on you and the thicker that it will get. But look what happens in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Now, when they saw the boldness and unfettered eloquence of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and untrained in the schools of common men with no educational advantages, they marveled and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So when Peter reached up this point, it is where the presence of God was so thick that people expected to be healed when his shadow fell upon them. And you can find this in Acts chapter five, verse fifteen. How many of you how many of you want the presence of God to be so strong that your mere shadow will bring healing to those who are bound. So putting on strength, pursuing this theme, we can now look at what Isaiah 52 verse 1 and 2 says. And it says, Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourselves from the dust, arise, and sit down in, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Awakening in spirit has to do with prayer. When it says, awake, awake, what it's really saying is, pray, pray. Because you will recall that the Lord Jesus, finding the apostles asleep as he waited for his betrayer in Gethsemane, said, Watch and pray. And you can find this in Matthew 26, verse 41. But here's how we, we'll put it another way. He said, stay awake and pray. Be alert. Do you know that it was, it was a commandment that we were, are to pray? In Jeremiah 10, 25, it shows us that God will judge the prayerless. For the families who do not call on your name... Or with the, with the world. We are commanded to seek the Lord. So the passage begins by telling us to awake, awake. Shake ourselves out of the liturgy. Pay the price. Seek the Lord with all our might. Enter into a deeper prayer life. Deeper love. And make Him our number one priority. That's what we're called to do. But you know, there are six things that, that will occur when you enter into, into your prayer. The first thing that will happen is you, we will be put on spiritual strength. And this strength is, will be great against Satan, against sin, and against any temptations. 
actually weakness will go away. A second thing that will happen is we will put on new holy garments. It's the garment of righteousness. And then, therefore, sin will not be able to touch us. The third thing that will happen is the uncircumcised and unclean would not be part of us. We will no longer have fellowship with the wicked. What do you mean? I won't have, I'm not going to have no friends? Well, let me tell you. You will have friends, but you will have good friends. You will have friends who love the Lord and will help you and encourage you. You need to get rid of the people from, from your past. They are the ones that kept you from knowing the Lord. They were probably the ones that, that caused you to sin. Who knows? I don't know what your life or what you did, but I know some of my friends were, were, were encouraging me to go do things I was supposed to. And the fourth thing that's going to happen is you will stop running here and there. This is the important one. Because everybody's looking for someone to pray for them and to get them out of trouble. What will happen is you will shake yourselves from the dust and from your misery and from your mess. And you will arise and be free. You will no longer need to have the preacher or have the pastor pray for you. You will be free. Fifth thing that's going to happen that when you sit down, you're going to sit down and rest. There will be peace. I'm talking about real peace. The peace that Jesus gives. The sixth thing that's going to happen is you will lose yourself.